Welcome to the Original Gangsters Podcast. I'm your host, Scott Bernstein. I am thrilled to have a very unique guest with me. She is a Boston, lifelong Boston resident uh, named Janet Euler, and she has a very unique, riveting story to tell related to the iconic Boston Irish mob boss, James Whitey Bulger. So I'm just going to give like a five, 10 second primer, and then I'm going to hand it over to Janet, and then she's just going to kind of tell us this um, this really crazy uh, kind of fate interjecting between the legal system, pop culture, a regular woman from uh, Barnstable, mm-hmm. Massachusetts, and, and and how that all became her story, which is big. And the, the primer is uh, Janet was a juror on the Whitey Bulger um, racketeering murder case and was one of the people that convicted him. And then after that, Janet, who is a, a, a registered nurse, uh, began a, a correspondence with Mr. Bulger in prison and became pen pals. And she actually visited him and built a relationship with him after the conviction. And uh, there are still a lot of questions six years later about the circumstances surrounding his his murder. And we know who did it, but I think, and I'm not going to speak for Janet, but we spoke off uh, off air that there are, you know, very conspiratorial slices of this that uh, point the finger at the federal government for kind of serving him up on a platter to be murdered. So Janet, thank you for joining us. You are very welcome. Thank you for having me. So really just, yeah, I guess you got <laughs> called to a jury in 2013. I did. And they seated me. I don't know why, <laughs> but when I went into the jury pool, I had very little uh, knowledge of Whitey Bulger. I had never been interested in organized crime. I confess to you, I've never even watched The Godfather, let alone read it. Um, So all I knew was the name and that he was allegedly the head of the Irish mob in Boston. So going in, um, I actually have written two books on the American Revolution in the past, and I put that down in the questionnaire, hoping that they would look at it and say, oh, my God, she wrote books. We don't want her. She might write a book, you know, but that didn't work. So they did seat me. And going in, I anticipated being horrified by his criminality, but I was not prepared at all for the criminality that was presented in the courtroom of not only the FBI, but the DOJ as well. And, you know, saying up front that I don't believe these federal organizations are evil in and of themselves, but of course you get bad apples in every group, right? So um, long story short of the 10 week trial, when the jury went into deliberations, five members of the jury did not believe that the key witnesses against Bulger were telling the truth. They were given such outrageous, immoral proffers or deals for their testimony. um, And they had admitted that they never thought Bulger would get captured in the first place. John Moderano, um, who had murdered 20 people in cold blood and had as many federal crimes pretty much against him as Bulger did, said that the prosecuting attorneys didn't just come to him once and give him his deal or twice. They came four times before they accepted that what he was telling them was good enough to go forward with. And Matarano and Flemmi were headed for the electric chair. So basically, every time they came to Matarano and said, you're not giving enough, us enough information, it was you're going to fry Johnny, right? And so he upped it every time until they accepted it. So therefore, as I said, five members of the jury did not believe their testimony. We figured that if we were facing the electric chair, we would say whatever they wanted to hear. So when the trial ended, I determined that I was going to find out everything I could about Bulger because I had so many questions, even after sitting through 10 weeks of this. 
And I quickly realized, not only through the books, but through the newspaper articles, that um, all the story, the narrative that was out there about Bulger was started by these same witnesses who five members of the jury didn't even believe were the truth. So that was a shock. And then I quickly realized that none of the journalists that had written about Bulger had ever gone to him to ask him a single question or ever corresponded with him to ask him questions. Now, with my background in writing about uh, the American Revolution, I knew you always go to primary source information. So that just was uh, mind boggling to me. So I ended up getting in touch with not only Bulger's attorneys, but the prosecuting attorneys as well. They did not respond, got in touch with some of the witnesses and um, ended up writing to Bulger. And um, I think the first thing uh, I did before writing to him was I met with one of his attorneys, Jay Carney in Boston. And from the moment we sat down for lunch, I had wished I was taping the conversation because everything he said was just unbelievable about things that were not allowed to be presented to the jury. Um, the first thing he told me was that when Bulger was arrested in California by the FBI, he had agreed to plead guilty to all, all charges and take an expedited death sentence. And the thing he would like in exchange for that was leniency for his girlfriend, Catherine Gregg, because she had no priors. Right. Well, this was taken to the prosecuting attorneys when Bulger presented uh, it to his defense attorneys and the prosecuting attorneys turned this down. They wanted the multi-million dollar trial and they ended up throwing 12 years at Catherine Gregg. Ultimately, it was 12 years at her and the first year was in solitary confinement. Now, if she had been married to him, his sister, his mother, none of that would have happened. And again, she had no priors. Well, during his trial, um, it had come up that the um, probation department had recommended two years for Catherine Gregg. And the prosecuting attorneys had turned that down. Now, that would have been considered leniency for Bulger, and he would have pled guilty and taken an expedited death sentence, but they wouldn't accept it. The other thing that came up in his trial was that Johnny Matarano's girlfriend testified. Um, she had been on the run with Johnny on the limb down in Florida for the same amount of time that Bulger and Catherine Gregg were on the limb, 16 years. And she testified that she flew up to Boston numerous times from Florida, picked up envelopes filled with thousands of dollars in cash, and either stayed with her mother for a little while or turned right around at the airport and flew back to Florida. She also uh, testified that she lied to a grand jury twice. And what was her punishment for this? She didn't get one. She never set foot in a prison. So just the balance here of justice was just, you know, uh, ridiculous or the imbalance. I should well, say. You, you had a, just to interject one thing, you had a situation, and I'm not, you know, advocating for either side of this. I'm just trying to objectively contextualize. Mm -hmm. you, you had this 20 year deal with the devil, quote unquote, and who, and I guess we could argue who the, de the devil was uh, between devil? the government <laughs> and, and Bulger, but you had both of these entities working together from, I'm just going to put a number up, but I know it's not exact, but let's say 75 to 95. Um, and it was, a, again, any way you split the hairs, it was an unholy alliance. And if you're Bulger, you're a criminal. You're supposed to be doing illegal things and shady things. If you're the government, you're supposed to be upholding the law and, and upholding yourself to the highest level of ethical and moral standards. And it's clear to me that whatever happened from when 
uh, Baldrin was caught in 2011 to when he was convicted in 13 and then eventually killed in 18 in prison. The, the government was in, you know, CYA mode, uh, trying to mitigate, manipulate, cover up all of the shadiness, all of the wrongdoing on their end. So it was like this huge overcompensation um, where, like you're saying, and this is par for the course when you're talking about a target like Bulger, where they just want to jam anyone and everyone in his orbit as an F you to him and anybody that seemed to be helping him. So, again, we can sit here and we can talk about who was benefiting most. And I, I don't know if we'll ever know. But mm -hmm. we do know, and I'm going to throw it back to you now, that there was a vendetta on the government's part, it's clear to me. Um, and that vendetta, in my opinion, had just as much to do with the embarrassment and the trying to, again, overcompensate for their wrongdoing than it did with Whitey Bulger, the iconic criminal. So, I mean, the government was uh, trying to do whatever they could to make it look better on their end. And the more they dra dragged him out in public and put him on trial and told everyone what a horrible human being mm -hmm. it was, it was easier for them to say, well, you know, it wasn't our fault. Yeah, we're the good guys. Look yeah. at us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's some, there's some truth in that, I'm sure. And even it, during the trial, a, a confusing aspect for me anyway, was that they never presented Bulger as the head of this group of criminals. They had a poster where they had Bulger, Moderano, and Fleming all at the top. And mm -hmm. then they are men under them. Right. So they were all presenting it almost as they all ran this thing. It wasn't just Bulger. And so also when the trial ended, it was like, why were they willing to give these deals to men like Moderano and Flemmy, who if you com combine their murders, yeah. were more murders than Bulger committed. And their crimes also equal to what Bulger, the federal crime. So... What was the focus on Bulger? Why were they determined to make him the monster and, and let these other guys go? In fact, if you even read anything on Bulger, he's referred to as a monster. Yeah. We do not refer to John Moderano as a monster or Steve Flemmy as a monster. They created this whole no, no, In my opinion, they were... They were all monsters. Well, I mean, but they created this yeah. whole narrative. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so I ended up uh, getting in touch with Bulger, sent him the first letter, just introduced myself. His letter back was rather comical in a strange way. He said that he didn't trust judges or police or FBI and a long list. And at the bottom of the list, he said jurors. <laughs> so it was like, OK. But then he did say that his attorneys had talked to him and that maybe he should give it a chance. So we ended up over the course of five years um, regularly corresponding. I have 70 letters from him. Uh, he had about the same amount from me. I He put me on his visitation list. I went to visit him three times when he was in Florida. Actually, I went four times. The fourth time, they would not let me in. Um, and I spent approximately 15 hours with him in conversation. There was nothing between us. We weren't on phones with the plexiglass or anything like that. He had an awful lot to say. Um, he was not, he was a complex individual in that when he would talk about his family, he would talk about his love of animals and, uh, very compassionate, very sensitive in that regard. The children that were in the visitation area, visiting their father, he was playing peekaboo with them. He'd point out a mother across the hall. Janet looks, she's fantastic with that toddler. But when we switched to the topic of his criminality, it was his countenance changed. There was a change. Um, he never denied his criminality. In fact, he frequently said to me in letters or in person, don't ever forget I'm a criminal. 
He never, he, well, I shouldn't say never. He denied a few of the murders, um, but admitted to a murder that he had been acquitted of. And he went into detail with me. This was when we were um, in person of how he would have committed the murders that he denied being part of and why he was not part of them. So I would step away and realize, because he would tell me too, he was a master manipulator. <laughs> so I would step away and kind of weigh what he told me and, you know, try to feel out if maybe he was trying to manipulate me or was he trying to be honest, to, you know, so he could get his story out. So um, the other thing about him and the reason I stayed connected to him was uh, when he wrote his letters, he would write the time of day on his letters. And it was always one, two, three in the morning. So very early on, I asked him why he was awake at that time. And his response was, ever since MK Ultra, I can't sleep more than two hours, I wake up hallucinating. And ended up the hallucinations were that wild animals were attacking him. So I asked him, what the heck is MK Ultra? It wasn't brought up in his trial. And as you know, I sent that letter out. And in the meantime, I started looking it up myself and found a good amount of material about it and his name associated with some of it. So tell and, people that don't know what, what that is. I would, yeah. In a nutshell, MK Ultra was a highly secretive CIA experiment back in the 50s and 60s where they were using LSD to attempt to manipulate behavior, a behavior modification. And um, when the CIA got found out or suspect was suspected of doing this, they attempted to destroy all the records they had on it. A small amount of the records survived and were found, and the United States Senate had a hearing on it in 1977. Just for so, people, to, just for just to call her up a little bit, they were using for people that might not know this, they were using. Bureau of Prison inmates as guinea pigs mm -hmm. that if they agree to participate in these trials, uh, which they knew, I mean, nobody knew what LSD was back then. This was 10 years, 15 years before it hit the, you know, the mass consumption sphere. Um, in, in, in exchange for participating in this very top secret, very dangerous um, experiment, you would get time uh, taken off your sentence. So Whitey Bulger did a cost benefit analysis in his head and said, I'll undergo the experiments. It will take, I think five, six years off the sentence. Um, well, he, you know, he said that it didn't take that much off their sentence. And he said back then that they would come in frequently to offer these experiments to the prisoners and yeah, to get time off their sentence, they were treated better while they were in the experiment and he said also for some of them, they felt like they were part of society in participating. He had just finished an experiment to find a cure for whooping cough uh, to save the lives of babies. <clears throat> so they came in and they said that they wanted to do this experiment to find a cure for schizophrenia. And they presented themselves as medical doctors. So he and eight other men uh, went into this experiment not knowing, being lied to about what was happening. I asked him about his memories of it. He was only 26 years old, and that's important to know because today we realize that the human brain isn't even fully developed until around the age of 26. So this is a vital time for his brain development. Um, he was hooked up to a big machine when they put the medication in him. And I found pictures of this big machine. Everything he was telling me, I was checking out. He said that while the medication was going in, they would ask repetitious questions over and over and over. And this went on three times a week for 15 months. I saw a little, a page of the, uh, of the prison hospital record of the doses he was getting. So um, this 
repetitious questioning was three times a week for 15 months. And he said, one of the questions was, have you ever killed anyone? And the second was, would you ever kill anyone? Now, at this point, Bulger was in prison for robbery, uh, a bank robbery. He had never killed anyone. So um, there, the eight others in the uh, experiment with him, two of them ended up getting taken out of the experiment. At first, he couldn't remember their names. Then he did remember their names. I got um, I got in touch with the prison and got the records for who was in the prison at that time to see if he was telling me the truth about this. And yes, those two men were listed as prisoners at that time. He said they got taken out stark raving mad. One was foaming at the mouth. The other one was stiff as a board and they never returned. And he always wondered if they survived or what had happened to them. So now in his letters also, <clears throat> he when he wrote about Alcatraz, it was always positive things about Alcatraz. He enjoyed his stay at Alcatraz. <laughs> and of course, I thought this is weird. And then the realization hit me that the only thing that saved him from this 15 month um, experiment was his transfer to Alcatraz. And if you look at the pictures of Bulger of prior to him going into prison in Atlanta, where this was happening, and then another picture of him going into Alcatraz, his whole countenance is different. It's totally changed. So um, again, he thought he knew he was sleep deprived for 60 years because of it these hallucinations he would have. He said he could never sleep in a room, the same room with an animal or a woman, because if when he woke up with these hallucinations, he would beat them up thinking wild animals were attacking him. Um, so I, I found an account of a man who was part of this experiment as well, and he was taking his case all the way to the Supreme Court because it was not just in the prisons that they did this. This man was in the military and his family had left him because he hallucinated that wild animals were attacking him and he would beat up his wife and kids. So they left him and he took his case to the Supreme Court and they threw it out for matters of national security. And the attorney that was helping him with that is still an an active attorney, a practicing attorney. So things were, were, you know, working out as far as what he was telling me and the reality of it. So I ended up getting hold of the 1977 U.S. Senate hearing. And at that time, there was a new head of the CIA, not the same one that was there during uh, the this experimentation. And the new CIA director was at an Admiral Turner. And he said in his opening remarks that he could only guess at how many were involved in this because the vast majority of the records were gone. He said that he guessed that they did it on 1,000 military personnel. They did it in 44 colleges and universities in America, 12 hospitals, and three federal prisons. Now, we know today that Bulger was part of it because he came out and identified that prison. As far as I know, we don't know the other two prisons. And we know at least one of the colleges because um, um, Ted Kaczynski was in at Harvard when it was being when, when it was done to him at the age of 17. He was 17, an undergrad at Harvard, and they did it to him. And of course... For those that don't realize it, Ted Kaczynski is known as the Unabomber. Unabomber. Yep. We also have two biographers that have come out within the last few years and said there are three ties to Charles Manson and his family to some CIA operatives that were working in San Francisco. So uh, this is kind of huge. <laughs> so in this um, Senate hearing, there is one question from a Senator Huddleston from Kentucky, and he asked Admiral Turner if there was a portion of this experimentation that was leaning toward making a person violent or homicidal, and the answer was yes. So, what do you do? What do you do with this? You know, what do you do with this? 
Um, my thing was in giving um, uh, interviews to the Associated Press. I did NBC News, CNN. And if I had known this about Bulger, about this experimentation at the time of deliberations, I could not have said he was guilty of any of the murders simply because, you know, did he kill these people? Yeah, he admitted he killed these people, even in private to me. But was he programmed to kill these people? So how could you say he was guilty? Well, and then he was being, and at the same time, he's being operated by the federal government while he's killing these people. So it was like they created this Frankenstein type character right. that they that they then let loose into society mm -hmm. and then realizing that maybe there was a benefit to go back to him and team up with him again uh so it's like he was in some ways created and then bought and paid for and sponsored by the federal government while he was creating this boogeyman uh persona in in the underworld it's like you said it's it's very complex it's not black and white at all it's not black and white. I don't know if you're referring there to his being an FBI informant. Yeah. Okay, because he denied that to his dying day. Right. Well, so it, it depends on, I think, from my understanding of it, uh, it, some of what Whitey was saying at the end was semantical. Like, he acknowledged that he had a relationship with John Conley, mm -hmm. but we, to this day, to your point, and to what he was saying, and again, I think you're going to find the truth somewhere in the middle uh, between what the government said and what Whitey was saying. But Whitey's whole thing was, I was corrupting the government. The government wasn't corrupting me. Like I was taking information from them, but I wasn't giving them right. information. Right. Uh, well, it, it was in the trial. There was testimony for 10 days about the informant file and about him being an FBI informant. And when we went into deliberations, even though we had to sit through hours of this testimony, it was nothing that the jury had to deal with whatsoever. But in that testimony, they had FBI agents come in, former FBI agents come in that testified against Connolly and Morris's informant file on Bulger. These guys testified that Connolly and Morris would both go into their informant files. They would lift information from it verbatim mm -hmm. and put it into this Bulger informant file, mm -hmm. simply changing the date or the uh, and the identity of the informant. Bulger claimed that until he this trial occurred, he had no idea that they had an informant file on him. The other thing that was brought up in the trial was the face page of the informant file in comparison to the face page of other, quote unquote, legitimate informant files. And the one for him was not legitimate. It wasn't filled out properly. It didn't have certain information that it required um Bulger's take on that to me was that he felt like they needed to have a reason for why they were in his company as mm -hmm. frequently as they were in his company so they created this informant file for that he told me that he paid both Connolly and Morris the equivalent of five hundred thousand dollars each for information that they knew would lead to the deaths of individuals mm -hmm. And uh, he had no love for either of them at the end, believe me. I have well, been because he was playing them, and then they tried to make it seem like they were playing him. right, exactly. <laughs> and I have been in touch with John Connolly as well. I actually sent information to the, the courts in Florida to aid him um, to some degree in his is trying to get out of uh, that situation down there. And I put it to John Connolly frequently in letters. Why are you lying about this? And I have a letter from him where he's because he thought he was going to be let out much earlier than he was. 
And he said, you know, when I get out, I will tell the entire unvarnished truth. Well, he hasn't said a single right. yes, it's a <laughs> so, t- Can you talk a little bit about, you know, meeting him and being with him for 15 hours and... And you mm-hmm. talked a little bit about it before, a, a kind of humanizing him and making him more multidimensional. But um, it was scary. It was scary. Um, I was pretty sick to my stomach before I got to the prison the first time. Of course, I had seen him for ten weeks sitting right in front of me, you know. But that's that's very different. Um, he uh, he wanted somebody to come with me the first time. He didn't want me to come by myself into the prison. So um, I actually, my son was going to come with me, my son, Josiah, and Josiah um, passed away before we went for that first uh, meeting with Bulger. And Bulger was very um, uh, comforting in regard to the situation I was going through. I had sent him a picture of my son and his response was, uh, he told me he put his picture in with pictures of other friends he had had that had passed away. And he said, Josiah is the rose among the thorns. I mean, he could be very compassionate in those situations. I ended up bringing my sister and um, my sister was terrified. (laughs) Of course, she didn't sit in front of him for 10 weeks. And at one point she asked him if he thought he was going to die in that prison, in the Florida prison. And it was an awkward question. And she was stumbling over the question. And he looked at her and because she wasn't saying, do you think you're going to die? She was trying to word it in a particular way. And he looked at her and he just said it point blank. Are you asking me if I think I'm going to die here? <laughs> she says, yeah. And he said, um, I, it's not a bad prison to die in. And then he put his hand up and pointed at me while he's talking to her. He's not looking at me. He's just pointing at me. And he said, and there are some jurors who think I should die in prison because I had said that in an interview. And I looked at him and I laughed and I said, yeah, and you still wrote back to me. So we had that back and forth that sometimes he would t- try to intimidate or something and I would just kind of throw it back at him. Um, like I said, he had compassion, he had empathy, he was not a sociopath, um, but he was scary when we talked about his criminality. But the other thing was he was not well. He had had eight heart attacks um, while in prison, and he was hospitalized for three of them. In his letters and when talking to him in person, he would tell me the medications he was on, what he was going through, different symptoms. And he was on standing orders for oxygen and nitroglycerin. I cannot diagnose as a nurse, but it sounds like coronary artery disease and he would have required uh, stents, so surgery to fix that. He felt like the next heart attack, the ninth heart attack would kill him and it quite possibly would have. He was also uh, wheelchair bound. He could not walk. He had fallen out of bed so many times because of the hallucinations. And now he's falling onto our hard concrete floor and he damaged his hips. According to his letters, it took the prison four months to even do an x-ray on his hips. And by that time he could not walk. When I went to visit him, I could see his lower legs and he had a bilateral vascular insufficiency, so poor blood flow, and he had weeping edema. So his legs were swollen and there was fluid coming through the skin. He was in bad shape. And again, to correct that situation, as far as the damage to his hips would have probably required surgeries. He was 89 years old. So, They had been telling him for eight months that they were going to transfer him to a medical prison. And the transfer, I found out from one of his attorneys, was going to be to Massachusetts. And they he was also talking in the last year, talking and writing in the last year of his life, that he was determined to do a national interview. 
He wanted to talk not only about what he had found out about MK Ultra and the depth of it and what they may have done to his brain, of course, not knowing he wouldn't get out of prison by giving this interview. He was as concerned in his conversations with me about the military personnel that they did this to and the kids in colleges. Um, so wanted to discuss this. And he was going to talk about the depth of corruption in the Boston FBI and how much he paid to Connolly and Morris for information. Did he ever, can I just ask you one question, interrupt you, I apologize. Did he ever mention Frank Salemi and the corruption that involved Salemi's cooperation in regards to nailing Connolly? Because the FBI, this was after Bulger was on the run. This was in 99. They were so eager to nail Conley that they cut a deal with Salemi, who was, do you know who Frank Salemi is? Yeah. Mm -hmm. They cut a deal with him and allowed him to basically ignore about 10 murders that he had been involved in, cut a deal acknowledging murders that he had committed back in the 60s, but refusing to acknowledge all of his victims in the 90s um, and cut a deal with him knowing that he was lying. Mm -hmm. Did did Bulger ever mention Salemi? He didn't his... mention it in that. He, re he mentioned Cadillac Frank Salemi, but yeah. he did not go into that. Um, and That's almost equally as bad. That all these victims' families oh, don't yeah. get closure because you want to uh, give the guy that did it a deal for something that had nothing to do with this and, and allow, give him a free pass for 10 bodies. Well, go all the way back to um, uh, Barbosa. Yeah. Right. The animal, right? And what they did with him. And mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah, it's been an ongoing thing even so before Bulger came on the scene. Right. So my, I guess my point is we're talking about here the, the, the high profile, well known corruption in the Whitey Bulger, Boston FBI. But this was happening before with the federal government, law enforcement in Boston, and it was happening after. So right. it seems to be epidemic of that entire office for decades. It, do, it does seem to that. And Rhode Island was even worse. Yeah. <laughs> so, so there you go. But um, so he wanted to do this interview. I have gotten in touch since he died with a New York Times journalist who confirmed that he gotten in touch with him to do an interview like this. Um, and it, he was writing to 100 people worldwide, he told me, um, Bulger told me, and he was writing about MK Ultra and what he had discovered and this other stuff he wanted to talk about. So finally, his uh, transfer to the medical um, hospital came, or the, the prison hospital came through. And in the middle of the transfer, literally in the middle of the transfer, the Bureau of Prisons announced that his health had suddenly improved. It was a blatant lie, Scott. It was a blatant lie. They transferred him to West Virginia, to Hazleton. According to the New York Times journalists I've been in touch with, the prisoners knew before the guards knew that he was coming. Well, I've talked to people, I've talked to people that were on the inside and it, it, for, it, at least 42 hours, if not 72 hours before he reached there, it was known within the GP and people were planning on how yeah. to kill him when he got there. because she had the one guy who was New England Mafia, and of course, they're waiting to kill him because they've been told he was an FBI informant. But well, I don't, hmm? I was well, I don't know how much you know about this. I'll just throw this out there, and again, I'm, I apologize for interrupting you. One of the guy that actually killed him, Freddie G's, yeah, he had a personal issue with Whitey because Whitey had helped convict wrongly, according to um. Uh, to Freddie, a guy named another guy named Freddie, Freddie Weichel. Oh, I who, could tell you about that one too. Yeah. Oh, I've got stories about that. Bulger talked a lot about Freddie Weichel right. and feeling bad for him and trying to help his brother get him out of prison. Right. But, so G, but even I'm that G, whole scene was, right. you know, twisted. Right. And but I'm saying G, G had it in his mind that right. Whitey had uh, 
uh, railroaded his buddy Freddie Weichel. Oh uh, yeah. So yeah. he had, it, it was it was like you had all this anger from the New England guys, and at the the tip of the spear was this guy who felt like it was a, it was personal with him. Right. But you know, just backtracking a little with the whole informant thing too, and I'll hopefully remember to go forward with this was that when when Morris ran to the Boston Globe to tell them that he was an FBI informant, the heat was coming down on Morris. Now, this came out in the trial, okay? And Morris um, wanted basically to knock, have what Bulger killed before he could say anything against Morris about this involvement with them. So in the trial, Whitey Bulger told his attorneys and they told the judge that John Morris had come to Bulger just prior to all this with the Boston Globe, because not only was the heat coming down for John Morris, just like it was for the rest of them in 1995, but John Morris's wife wanted a divorce. Okay, I believe her name was Rebecca. And she wanted a divorce um, because she, she was, she found out first of all, that he had been sleeping with his secretary for five years. And the other thing was she knew he had money that was unaccounted for. And he admitted in his own testimony that it wasn't just Bulger that he was corrupted by, but two other organized crime figures as well. And he would frequently bring these guys home to his family for dinner. Bulger and these two other people. Now, can you imagine Rebecca Morris? It's like, guess who's coming to dinner? I mean, yeah. holy I God. Bet of, I bet one of them was Mark Rossetti. I don't know. They never said the names well, of the other two. Mark okay. Rossetti was another guy that we found out later on, had a relationship with the FBI. He was a, a, a capo underneath Frank Salemi. He was one of Frank Salemi's main hitmen, and he was killing people while being operated by the fbi so I, i'm putting my money on the guy beside or the two one of the guys besides bulger that that morris was protecting with mark uh, it was maybe was so um yes yeah, so mars so bulger told the court that morris had come to him and asked him to kill his wife before the divorce took place because for any of us that have been involved in divorce, you know you have to do what's called your financials. And you have to count for every penny that you have as, as a married couple. Well, Mrs. Morris knew they had unaccounted money, a lot of it. And so he didn't want her bringing that into the financial aspect of the divorce. So he asked Bulger to kill her. And Bulger said he told Morris that he was not going to kill her, that he needed to pay her off. And um, but but, you know, so so Morris had made that attempt. And so the heat's coming down. Morris knows he had told Bulger this with everything else that had gone on between them. So Morris runs over to the Boston Globe. Now, Scott. An FBI agent is never, ever, 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 ever supposed to tell who an, an informant is to, to release their identity. Right. Not only does Morris do this, but the eager journalists at the Boston Globe, who should have known that he never was supposed to do this, accepted this story and ran with it unethically. Yeah, on, on the front page. Yeah. So... They were all called in front of a judge at one point by the name of Nancy Gertner, a federal judge. And basically, she told them that she thought that what they were attempting to do was have Bulger murdered by either the mafia or his own gang members for being an informant. It was on the front page of the Boston Globe. Yeah. I think it was in 1989, 90 or early yeah. 90s. Yeah, around then. But guess what happened? The FBI and his gang members didn't believe, believe him. Believe him, right. That was Whitey's whole thing. Nobody will ever believe that. This is they didn't so crazy. believe yeah. it. Right. But somehow that narrative still pushed its way through. And now you go to 2018 and a guy in a prison in West Virginia does believe it and kills him. Well, so, I think there was a handful of guys in that prison. That wanted uh, him and as And as we know, or as we've learned, uh, Hazelton 
AKA Misery Mountain, one of the worst federal penitentiaries you can go to. And they happen to have a pretty significant portion of New Englanders, the, the, the really bad inmate New Englanders, uh, a lot of them get sent there. So yeah. it was like there was a number of factors that if you lay out yeah. uh, with the transfer and how we ended up there and how we ended up in general population and and then the timeline that we know about the general population knowing for at least 48 hours that he was coming there. And then once he hits general population, he only survives like eight, nine hours. There's so many questions. I don't think, I don't know if we'll ever have answers to them, um, but there, there's a lot of questions about how that all happened and who knew what when. And the, the fact that they saw these guys going into his cell on camera, they didn't get indicted for three and a half years. And now they're basically getting a slap on the hand for his murder. The thing is this, Scott, the man was dying. Mm -hmm. It was a matter of months before he died of a ha heart attack. A matter of months. His, one of his attorneys had seen him shortly before that transfer, and he described to me physically how he was. And he was in awful condition, even worse than when I had seen him prior to that. He was dying. But for some reason, he wasn't dying fast enough. They lied about sending him there. I've sent a letter to every member of the United States Judicial Committee telling them I have documentation outlining his health. And it was a blatant lie. Of course, none of them responded. So the question is this for me, and I think it should be for many people in the country. Why was he sent there? And who sent him there? Right. Who wanted him assassinated? That's and the in, question. And in the report, in the I read at least a, a, a majority of the uh, prison, the BOP uh, investigation into what happened. And even though I don't agree with some of the language they have about, oh, it was a mistake or it was an innocent error, you can see even through those admissions that like some of the stuff that was coming out um, when it, when it was first reported that he died or when it was first reported that he was killed in October of 18, one of the big narratives that proved to be false by the investigation of the, the BOP investigation itself was that he had requested to go into general pot. That's not, if you read the investigation, this they're, they're chalking it up to a, a quote unquote mistake in the intake um, and that he wasn't supposed to go there. He never requested to go there. No. He was going to go, was supposed to go into a PC unit or a medical unit. Um, and they acknowledge that it was a mistake to put him into PC. But my point is at first, the official line from the BOP was that, well, he wanted to come here and he wanted to go into general population. No, he didn't. Neither. Neither. He needed to be at that medical prison in Massachusetts. His condition was that serious and they wanted him dead. I think the BOP was virtually thrown under the bus. I don't think it was the BOP that did this. I think they were told to do this. And the question is why? And my theory, my strong theory, my belief is because he was going to do a national interview. Yeah. And he was going to talk about things that would call into question the CIA, the FBI, and the DOJ. And they couldn't let that happen. So take your pick as to which one of those agencies it was, or maybe all three combined. The other thing is the Bureau of Prisons um, likes to throw out the story of the nurse that felt threatened. And that was Donna part Florida, of the Donna reason Florida. they had to. Right. I have that whole thing in a letter that Bulger told me about way before any of that came out in newspapers, just like the Freddie Weichel thing. Mm -hmm. Stuff he wrote me about that way before anything came out in newspapers. And the story of that as a nurse was horrifying. He went to, what did you call it, sick bay in a prison? I'm not even sure. But he went because he was having um, cardiac symptoms. And this nurse 
told him he needed to go to the hospital, according to his letter. She wouldn't give him the nitroglycerin that was he was ordered to have. She wouldn't even give him oxygen. He was having a heart attack, and this nurse refused him the care to lessen the pain, which is agonizing, insisting he had to go to the hospital. He pled with them to get a doctor to come in who finally came in and gave him the nitroglycerin and gave him the oxygen and then sent him to the hospital. Yeah. Now, he did say in the middle of this heart attack to this nurse, something to the effect, I'm going to get you or however it says, as a nurse, I don't think I would have been, felt threatened by this guy dying of a heart attack saying that to me. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, but I don't think I would have. So that whole story needs to be. But even if you wanted to move him out of Coleman, that doesn't mean you send him to GP at no. Hazleton. Like no. you said, you send him to Massachusetts to Devons, right? Which is their medical unit. Uh, I know a lot of people that have been through there. Um, guys from Detroit. Uh, one one major figure from Detroit spent his last couple of years in the hospital there uh, at Devons, and uh, that 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 would have been traditional protocol or uh, mm -hmm. standard operating protocol. Um, so it's, uh, I, I, I don't have any doubts in my mind that this was a conspiracy to serve him up to be killed. And, and I still believe that Whitey Bulger was a, uh, in a lot of ways, a horrible human being and deserved to spend the rest of his life in prison. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, and I, we know, we know, and you know personally that there were a lot of mitigating circumstances and and stuff that don't normally apply to people right. that reach that level of um, notoriety or dare I say popularity. I don't know if it's the right word, but you know the notoriety in in the in, from the masses. But nobody, I don't. You, you, the United, the government is supposed to do things the right way. If if you want to nail somebody for doing something horrible. Then have you know everything buttoned up? Yeah. Cross all your T's, dot all your I's. The the ends does not justify the means. And you can think whatever you think about James Whitey Bulger, but the idea that the U.S. government and I fully believe this, and I know, you know I don't need to to back up what you're saying, but I feel like I feel very uh, passionately about what you what you're saying. I remember saying it the day it happened. Right. Um, this is not what, that's not America. That's not the no. U.S. justice system. We're, no. we're not, we're not k killing people to keep them quiet or to think they deserve to be murdered. So we're going to do it. And, and the government's going to aid and abet it. This, this is everything that's wrong about America and democracy, whether you love, hate, despise James Bolger or not. This is not no. what, this is not right. And I did, and I give a lot of talks on this, and I actually give a six-week course on it. And people will ask me, "Why are you doing this? Aren't you afraid? Are you afraid they're going to come after you or whatever?" I said, "Yeah." I said, "But the reality of it is this. The reality of it is this. I wrote two books on forgotten heroes of the American Revolution. That's my passion. Mm -hmm. And those men and women were willing to lay down their lives to establish this nation." And one of the foundational pillars that they established this nation on was that of a fair and just judicial system because they were being abused in the courts by Great Britain. And that pillar is corroding. Mm -hmm. And when it falls, this nation falls with it. So, so here you have a case where it is obvious if you just step back and look at it. So did they focus on Whitey Bulger to arrest him and give these deals to all these other guys focusing on him to get him because they knew or some of them knew they had created a murderer. And then they just wanted to kill him. Yep. So nobody shut him up before said. he realized it. Right. Mm hmm. Yeah, it's uh, this. This was really uh, uh, riveting. Thank you so much, Janet, well, for coming in and sharing your story. You're always welcome back. Please keep us updated on everything you got going. Hopefully, uh, I don't know if you're working on a book. Um, I actually have written a book about this, but it was written before he was murdered. And I'll tell you, they would not let him read it. 
And it was written as what's called a Romana clay. It's the true story with the key. And I was told by attorneys to do it that way. But um, yeah, they would not let him read it. And even at that, he was, uh, you know, he had a sense of humor, albeit a, a strange sense of humor. He told me that the, um, the, his fellow prisoners loved the title. It was called, it's called The Truth Be Damned and that they were making tattoos of it. And I'm thinking, oh, my God. <laughs> so. so It's the highest compliment you can get from someone like that. Uh, the, well, well, I'll tell you this. I hope people um, in, in Hollywood are watching this um, because this is, you know, I people come to me literally every day telling me they have a million dollar story or a billion dollar story. And a lot of them have fascinating histories but honestly what they're bringing to the table is the same story in different versions told over and over again right there are still a few stories within stories that have been told over and over again that still deserve to be told and i could see this as a, a docuseries or a, a television show or a film mm -hmm. um just really giving this the, the end of the whitey Bulger, the end of the whitey Bulger's uh story uh, a deep dive and a look at it from a totally different perspective right. from, a, some, from a person like yourself. So this was uh, incredibly um, enlightening for my audience. Thank you so much, Janet. And thank you, Scott, for the opportunity. And uh, next time I'm in Boston, I will give you a call. I love. Uh, I There's consider so it my much more to this story, Scott. I'll I consider it my second, my second home. My mom's, my whole side of my mom's family lives out there. So oh, okay. um, I will be there soon, and and we'll we'll hook up. Janet, this was amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Ben, behind the glass. And this is what you get at the OG pod. Uh, you know, these kind of interviews, this type of insight, this type of exclusivity. Uh, and we're going to try to bring Janet back uh, as this story kind of evolves more, because I don't think the last chapter has been written. And as, as Janet just said, it hasn't. So um, <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, I will see you guys uh, next week with another long, uh, long form interview. Scott Bernstein, OG pod. I'm out. Thank you.